Okay, so yes, so I'm going to you know talk in our group. So today I'm going to talk about the model I'm currently working on. I call it the flavorful composite hit model, where I try to connect the current B anomaly with the well-known hierarchy problem. And this model is based on the two paper I I published this year. Okay, so here is a brief overview about the connection. So this start, I'm studying the composite hit model and focusing on the SU4 over SP4 composite hit model. And in this code set, there is five pseudo Nambu Gaussian bosons. So four of them should to be the Higgs doublet. So there's still one more. So there are two choices. If the symmetry is global, then we get an additional pseudo Nambu Gaussian boson. And if the symmetry is local, then we expect a new TEB scale D prime boson. And on the other side, I'm also studying neutral current B anomaly. And people already figure out we might need some additional contribution to operation of uh, these two operators. And there are also two popular solutions. One is additional letter quark, the other is the boson. So the starting point of this research is can I use my can I use the Z prime boson in my composite model to solve to explain the neutral current B anomaly? And later we will see the connection can be realized by the relation between the composite hit model scale and the scale of B anomaly. And here is the outline. I will start with the introduction of neutral current B anomaly, talk about what people found and the ESP approach. Then I will move on to my model and the composite Higgs model and focus on the SU4 over SP4 process. And we have a Z prime boson in this model. I will then talk about the Z prime phenomenology including how we can explain B anomaly and all kinds of things. And in the end, I will show some combined analysis showing how the B anomaly solution can come out with hierarchy problem. Okay, so let's start with the neutral current B anomaly. So neutral current B anomaly is is a series of semi electronic decay B to S mu mu. People find some deviation in this pile of decay. So 
it starts from, I think, 2013, and people do a series of measurements. So it includes like the branch ratio, B2 can be view, all kinds of B2 can be view, and um, that's only decay like BS2 review. So it shows a common deviation that is the experimental results seems to be lower than the theoretical prediction. And but, but you can also see from this plot that the theoretical prediction suffers from the hydronic uncertainty, usually has a large error box. So people also do for some observable, which have a better theoretical prediction. And they call it the, the test of electron flavor universality. So they measure something called RK, which is just the ratio between B2K mu mu over B2KE. And the standard model prediction in this case, the, the hydronic uncertainty is canceled out, and they have a very clean prediction, which is saying that it needs to be close to one. And again, they measure different channels. So in 2017, they have results for, for K star final state. So it's available for our K star. And it shows the 2.5 sigma deviation. And the most significant one is RK, where they measure B2K mu mu versus B2K EE. And they just updated the result this March, and it shows around 3.1 sigma. And last month, they give another two results of about the new final state, although with larger error bar, but it still shows the same, same type of deviation. Is it the same? But on the previous slide, it was low or low Q squared. Okay. You mean Q squared? Prediction was above the deviation was at low Q squared in that plot, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But on the next slide, low Q squared fits and it's high Q squared that disagrees. Although I don't see any actual disagreement on that slide, the middle yeah. one. I think they are all low Q squared. Isn't know. it the same range of Q squared on both plots? So most of the deviation, so this this plot of this deviation of isn't that zero to twenty? Low Q squared. That's zero to twenty on the bottom axis, right? Oh, you mean here? Q squared. Zero to twenty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so in this plot they show from zero to twenty. And on the next slide. And yeah, so so let them flavor universality test. On the middle, one, on the middle one, one. On the middle one, it's zero to twenty again. Yes. Now the low Q squared looks like it agrees. There's the black, like the black error box, the black one. It's black one. Yeah, but I'm comparing with the predictions, which prediction is what? What are the error bars on the predictions? Are those it's a different small. experiments? It's, yeah, it's very tiny, so they usually don't show it. It's just phase space, right? And the Q squared is much larger than the real mass. Yeah, yeah. So it's very small. Mm. What's the Q squared? Oh. Q squared is like the, the mass of the B, right? The B is mass is much larger than the K mass. Yeah. The B mass is like close to 5 GeV, the K mass is like a half a GeV. The muon mass is 100 MeV.
So the three sigma is combined for all those experiments or just LHC? This is like just this range. And the RK from like one to six, Q uh, squared from one to six. Okay, thank you. Any other problems? So, so we see a series of deviation in BSD to S mu mu. So people try to combine this, all these experimental results. So what they did is using the standard model is attitude theory. So they list all the possible um, operators that could adapt this vertex and then put in all the experimental observable and do a global fit. And what they found is these two operators that they, can, they call it O9 and O10 contribute to this deviation the most. And here is the global fit result I get. So the you know, left hand side is the two dimension plot for C9 versus C10. And we can see so for blue one is, is for arcade measurements. And this uh, yellow green one is for BS to move. So, so it means that different observable have sensitivity to different operations. And they combine all the BS to mu mu results and the NR around the red region. So which shows the discrepancy is um, around like five or five four or five sigma in this plot. Or we can just see the 1D plot, one dimensional global fit. So we can see C9 and C10 or some linear combination of lens to the larger pool. So larger pool means they have better fit comparing to a standard model value. And here is the standard model prediction for C9 and C10. So you can see the deviation is roughly 10% of standard model value. So, so I mean, uh, why, I'm not understanding why they're focusing on C9 and C10 so much. Is it just because the other ones are constrained by other yeah. Decay is basically this is like the least, the thing that's the least constrained by other data. That yeah, yeah, yeah. So they actually include like all kinds of B two S process yeah. and. So this is really like a global that. fit. Sort of this is more like a global fit to the whole data, yeah, including yeah, yeah. this, and that other data is what kind of eliminates yeah, the other yeah. ones from being large. Okay, I got it. Thank you. And later in my model, I will focus on this case where C9 is equal to minus C10, which means both uh, quark stature and lepton stature is pure than handed. So later I will use this number. Okay, so now we know the operator we want. We can then look for the simplified model. So, for if we want to explain this by some tree level mediator, then there are several choices we have. One is e prime boson, and it can also be explained by either scalar or vector lateral point. And in, in different type of solution input imply different type of like UV symmetry, like for this time boson, 
if you want to build a UV model, it means some new you want time, big symmetry, and for the new lateral quark, it might imply some unified quark lateral symmetry. But in my model, I will focus on the Z time solution. And we also wonder what's the scale of this new physics. So if we assume the three level mediator with order one coupling, then we can just put in the coefficients on global fit and the new physics scale will be around 36 eV. And if that is the case, then this seems too large comparing to what is that for the hierarchy problem. But if the, the coupling is suppressed by some secant light rotation, which we call um, minimum flavor violation, if it is suppressed by that angle, then the expected new scale will be around 70. And it still seems too high, but later we will see in my model, the exact new physics scale also related to the ratio of charge between the standard model and vacuum. And if this ratio is something like one fourth, then the scale of new physics will be around one to two TeV. And that will be the scale we expect for a solution of hierarchy problem. Can I ask about the MFD um, mm -hmm. case? So in that case, I would expect that the Z prime coupling to let's say SS bar would be much larger. And so I would be worried about, even if you somehow suppress the up and down quark contribution, there's quite a bit of strange quark in the proton. And so I would be worrying about just draw yan production of the Z prime. So is that, is that is that really supposed to be okay for a so <clears throat> later we will see what really happened is more like some third generation specific um, interaction and okay. after some secant rotation. Okay, so actually SS bar, SSR will be yeah, SS bar will be Okay, now go on. I got the idea. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, so let's, let's move on to the solution to the hierarchy problem, the composite Higgs model. So in composite Higgs model, we introduce Higgs as the pseudo Nambucosum boson. So what we like to have is just analogy to what we see in QCD, where pi on as the pseudo Nambucosum boson is much lighter than all the other composite resonance. So we want to introduce case as the pseudo Nambucosum boson, then it could be much lighter than other resonance and thus explain what we see in the LHC. And the construction of a model is also analogous to QCD. So in QCD, we have chiral symmetry breaking, the global symmetry SU2 cross SU2 is broken down to SU2 diagonal, and which give us three massless Nambucosum boson, which are pions. But of course, we know pions are non massless because we also have some symmetry breaking term like EM interaction, like quark mass. So we end up, end up with some massive pion. So in composite Higgs model, we do the same trick. We have some global symmetry G and it's broken down to subgroup H around one TeV. And notice that at this stage, the electro wave symmetry is still preserved. And we will end up with at least four number goes from boson, which can serve as big doubles. And again, when we come after we considering other interaction like 
aging interaction, like retard coupling, X will get some non trivial potential and acquire back, which will then break the electro wave symmetry. This can be understood more clearly from this diagram. So, at first, we say the global symmetry is broken by this half vacuum. So, our subgroup H as well as the actual wave symmetry is preserved. So, once we consider the car coupling, gate interaction, the case will get some non trivial vacuum. Then you will rotate the bath, the bath F a little bit. And it's this projection that breaks the electrical wave symmetry. And also give us the massive Higgs, massive Higgs boson. Okay, and now in this picture, Higgs the pseudo number boson boson is like the angular degree of freedom in this figure. So so now it's no longer aligned with the electrical weak vacuum. So we expect deviation from the Higgs phasing. So we usually call this the nonlinearity of Higgs boson. And usually this one by the parameter to C, which is defined as the V square, the electrical weight back to 46. GV over X squared. And one example is that the Higgs coupling for a composite Higgs model comparing to a thin model prediction will be smaller by the cosine theta factor, which is related to Cassi like this. The name can be for a single, there's no extra A in the end, but it's okay. Oh, good new. Uh -huh. Can yeah. no, no, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's okay. So, uh, the yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so now we know the idea of composite his model, then we need to choose the closest to work on. So there are a lot of closest people are asking for. Most of them, the most popular one is, of course, the SO5 over SO4 process because we only give four pseudo Nambu Gosson boson. So you don't need to worry about the new degree of freedom. And this, and because you only give the Higgs doublet, so it's also called minimum composite Higgs model. But today, we are going to look at another type of composite Higgs model, which is called fundamental composite Higgs model. So it, it means the composite Higgs model, which have fermioni UV completion. So saying that it can be realized by fermions with some strongly coupled gauge interaction. So if we want to build a composite Higgs model in this way, then the global symmetry is restricted to, to these two types. So assuming that we have n Dirac fermion, then depending on the fermion representation under the gauge group, if they are complex representation, then we have SUN cross SUN global symmetry, which is what we are familiar with in the QCD. And if there are real or pseudo real representation, then we will get a larger global symmetry, which is like SU2N. And then based on this, we can find um, for fundamental composite Higgs model. The process is restricted to these three different styles based on the representation. 
So for real representation, we have SU over SO. For pseudo real, we have SU over SP. And for complex representation, we have this like what we have in QCD is SU plus SU over SP. So from this list, we will find that the minimum composite his model is not in the list because the SO5 global symmetry cannot be simply realized by fermion under uh, by fermion field under gauge dynamic. So we need to kind of extend the scalar center, but actually not too much because the next two minimum composite hit model is in the list, which is the SU4 over SP4 cosine. So with only one additional pseudo number goes to board. So that is the cosine we are going to work on in my model. Okay, so for SU4 over SP4 fundamental composite hit model, this, this composite hit model can be realized with four wild hyperfermions in a fundamental resonance representation of SP and hypercolor group. So the quantum number of these four wild fermions under the standard model gauge group is like this. So two of them form the SU2 doublet, and the other two, one with hypercharge one half, the other with hypercharge charge minus one half. So they are basically the doublet under SU2 custodial symmetry. And now these four wild fermions, they are from mental representation of SP group. So uh, they are pseudo real representation of SP group. So we can put them together and there is the global SU4 symmetry. And once the hypercolor interaction becomes strongly coupled, the hyperfermion will form a condensate and create this global symmetry from SU4 down to SP4. And this symmetry breaking can be described by a nonlinear sigma model, with sigma is the anti-symmetric tensor representation and require a graph like this. So the graph is chosen such that the electrical wave symmetry is preserved. And in this case, we will get, we can write down the Goldstone matrix like this. So we can see there are five pseudo Nambu Goldstone bosons, four of them will turn out to be the Higgs, and there's still a real singlet Higgs. And today we are not going to talk about Higgs. But instead, we will focus on this singlet X. So this singlet is corresponding to the broken U1 prime symmetry. So just as I mentioned in the overview, if this U1 prime symmetry is gauged, then we can expect to have a TV scale different boson. Then, and, and, I'll, then the first question will be, then why is this U1 prime symmetry? So we go back to see our four plates. So, so notice that there is charge conjugate for the right-handed fermion. So this one minus one operator turn out to be the hyperbaryon you want hyperbaryon symmetry for the hyperfermion. So it's like just counting a number of hyperfermions we have. 
Okay, so now we know this what is this one price symmetry. We will then we then want to ask, can we gauge this symmetry? So so far we only have interaction term with between the Z prime and hyperfermia. So here we use the definition of baryon number for so the charge of this hyperfermia is one over n. So now it's very similar to baryon number. So we also know we cannot get baryon number in standard model because we have as you to really you want anomaly. So to get rid of anomaly, we might need some new fermion, but actually we don't because we can just borrow standard model fermion. So if we include the standard model fermion because they have the same structure as hyperfermion, so just like in standard model, we know baryon number is anomalous, but it's but for B minus L, you become anomaly free. So what I did here is the same trick. I include standard model fermion and and with the opposite charge. So I put that's why I put a minus sign here. So I found if I include standard model fermion with charge one fourth. Then the then he becomes anomaly free. So here I only include a third generation because I, then I can also explain the neutral current B anomaly. So now this your prime symmetry becomes something like the standard model three minus hyperbaric. So it's like a hyperversion of B minus F. So now we have the interaction term, then we can calculate the Z prime mass. So Z prime can mass from the hyperfermion condensate. So it's proportional to the two times the hyperfermion charge times the coupling times the Maximum projection on the original um, original vacuum. So because it rotates a little bit, so you receive the factor sum. But this factor is very close to close to one. So later we will just ignore it. So yeah, Z prime mass. And here I would like to de define a Z prime scale because. When we when we deal with the indirect search, we are not sensitive to MZ prime. Instead, we are sensitive to the mass over the coupling. So here I define this Z prime scale, which is um, MZ prime over G Z prime. So this will be it will look like this. And as I mentioned, cosine is very close to one, so we can ignore it. So it will turn out to be two over n times f. And this the relation I mentioned, the relation between the scale for Z prime and the scale of composite Higgs model. Any questions so far? If not, we are going to the Z prime to now known. So now we know the Z prime interaction, we can then talk about Z prime phenomenology. But before that, we still need to specify the missing metric because the previous assumption, the Z prime only interact with the third generation fermion in the flavor basis. So if we want to discuss the phenomenology, we need to first figure out what is the interaction in the mass basis. And here I have to do a lot of assumptions. So the most general interaction 
we need to separate to that and this from me on and this from me on and they might have different location but to simplify our analysis I assume the Rahim deep mass basis is just aligned with flavor basis so I don't worry about that handy part and for that handy part because I'm only interested in B2F current and mu mu interaction. So I specify the sum type part and charge that one part with only second and third generation rotation. And if we only rotate the two and two, three inches, then the, the charge makes shape will then look like this. So it's one force times the rotational nature. So it's a strong assumption, but and it's a easier and simplify is a good way to simplify the parameter in this model. And we will especially focus on the two term as I mentioned, we care about the FD coupling. And here we also define the epsilon FD, which take out the charge and the coupling. So it's only sensitive to the mixing. And also we do the same thing for mu mu, which we take out the epsilon mu mu, which depends on the, the mixing angle. And later we will see the analysis is mainly based on these three key parameters, the Z prime scale, the missing, the two missing angle. Sorry, so you're 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 mixing the second and third generation. Left-handed quarks mm -hmm. and leptons. So you're having because you need you need because you need to, I'm sorry I'm just catching up you because you need to violate uh, lepton universality. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So I, I mean just just uh, this is maybe maybe should have asked this before but uh, uh, I had the impression that. Uh, you know, lepton universality is extremely well tested, right? And yeah. and yet you're going to be saying that this B, this lepton non-universality ratio in these B decays is what something like 10%. The ratio in the central value is like yeah, instead yeah. of being one, it's like 10% off, right? Yeah. So that's huge, right? Yeah. So how how is that just how can that possibly be allowed? With other all the other tests of lepton universality, you're going to talk about that. Later? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, You'll I talk really about that. Okay, good. I, I, I realize yeah. I have no idea how this could be possible. So, but the, actually, like this assumption, uh, I only focus on two three, so I already can can get rid of those like strongest con constraint from first and to first and second generation mixes. Okay, and you're for some reason, I'm not. Maybe I maybe it's just the notation that's bugging me, but why are you calling these angles oh theta e and d i don't understand the, the if they're left-handed why are you calling them d e just means electron type d means down type because these are left-handed mixing angles right yeah 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 okay i just your notation i don't like your notation but i, I guess that's okay i'll live with it okay <laughs> okay all right mm -hmm. i would call it like q3 and L3 uh, or something. But anyway, it's fine. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the first phenomenology we would like to use this to explain the neutral current B anomaly. So under the specified missing metric, because we only rotate the left handed, so we will have the left handed um, flavor changing current, and that will give us. The additional contribution on the CLL as I mentioned, and and we can write down 
and we can calculate the additional contribution on the cohesion will look like this. And then we fit the global fit result. So, so we can rewrite this coupling over mass as the parameter I mentioned, which is S1 SD, S1 mu mu over S prime squared. So that means if we want to explain neutral current B anomaly, this three parameter need to satisfy this relation. So as long as they satisfy this, they are able to explain the neutral current B anomaly we observe. So, so this part is just one. So it's just this relation. Okay, so we can solve the neutral current view anomaly, but then we have strong constraints from the neutral current, like uh, favor changing neutral current. So if we replace, if we have both sides as quarks, then we know there will be additional contribution to the BS meson mixing, which is well measured. And the experimental result is like this. Standard model prediction have a lot larger error, but it's still around 10%. So it put a strong constraint on the quark size vertex. Which requires DSB over MD prime to be smaller than well, one over 200 TeV. So it's a strong constraint. And again, we can change it to the parameter F prime and epsilon SD. So now, so we get the equation. So, so we get F prime need to be larger than F epsilon SD times 48 EV. But we know if it is thickened like this one can be very small. So it's probably fine. So then we can also put in the requirement from neutral, neutral current B anomaly, which is that the F prime needs to satisfy this relation. The superparameter needs to satisfy this relation. And it turns out it will give an upper bound on F prime like this. So what I'm doing here is, is like uh, if we want to if we want to satisfy, if we want to explain the neutral current B anomaly. And now we know the green point is strongly suppressed, then the vast one should be large enough to expand it. So that is the relation we get here. So the epsilon mu mu needs to be large enough. And because epsilon mu mu is missing angle, so it's from zero to one. So we actually put the max, the, the bound on the F prime, which is 2 TeV. And we can further combine these two relations and we can get the missing at quark set, quark size to be smaller than 0 0.04, which is small, but it's actually like thickened energy. So, is there any question on this page? And we also have flavor changing neutral current constraints from the lepton side, the charge lepton side, which the main constraint comes from tau to three mu. So. We can calculate the venture ratio and express it by epsilon mu nu. And the current bound is 
smaller than 10 to the minus eight, which is a constraint on a combination like this. So we can then combine this relation with this one, which can be put in the plus F prime versus epsilon mu mu. So, so the upper triangle is excluded when we combine the BS meson missing with the requirement of neutral current via normal. And the bottom area is ruled out by the requirement by the tau to three mu major. So we end up with the parameter space here, which requires a large epsilon mu nu. And we can also see like this is the maximum value for F prime, which is 2 TeV. And this region, so this region is viable, means that we can always find the parameter that can satisfy the neutral current via normal. Is there, is there something like, uh, are there any constraints on Z, Z prime mixing? So like no. just Z, we never see Z goes to mu E. We've never yeah, seen yeah. that, right? Yeah. So the bound on that branching ratio must be incredibly, incredibly yeah. strong. And at some level, the Z, I think, probably mixes with the Z prime. There's probably no exact symmetry. Maybe it's really small. I don't know. But I'm just wondering, is that, is that something that's been worked through? You know about? Or? I think they have. Yeah. We'll combine different action. Yeah. So. The mixing. I mean, in, in simple tree level models, right, these vacuum, these angles between mixing of Z prime and Z just tend to be like sine theta is the ratio of the VEVs. So it is suppressed by the ratio of the VEVs, but not a lot. <laughs> That's yeah, not yeah, going to yeah. be enough, right? Yeah. So you've got a factor of three in the VEVs. So even with a loop factor or something. I don't know. I just worry that this, this constraint has to be insanely strong. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. And that mm. directly bounds your mixing angle. Mm. Uh, Brian, do you have a big fan electron neuron coupling? Um, under the, the specified metric, there's no first and second generation mixing. So, oh, electron mu on right. So sorry, right. Electron mu on it would be more like mu tau. Yeah. So I, I'm sorry. Yeah, I should have said. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm thinking of lep. Yeah, and I should have said mu tau. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Thanks. So so far we discussed the uh, indirect constraint. And we also have the rest of it. So, because this Z prime, so we already have all the interaction. So we can calculate the decay width. We can calculate the branching ratio. So, so the branching ratio is quite simple because it couples universally to a third generation. And, and also the quarks in the quark side, the miss angle is small, as we mentioned. So the branch ratio for PT bar and BB bar is just 3 8. And for muon, it will be proportional to epsilon mu mu like this. Then we can calculate the cross section. So for Z prime, which only coupled to the third generation, the main production will come from BB bar fusion. So we can write it down like this. We can take out the charge and coupling and end up with a sigma BB, which only depends on 
the map. And it turns out the most density channel will be the mu the muon channel. So we can calculate the cross section in the muon channel. Just multiply these two together, and you will end up like this. And one interesting thing we can do is that we actually get a lower bound of absolute mu mu, as we mentioned in, in the last section. So we have absolute mu mu need to be larger than f prime over two. So it's below this area. So what we can do here is we can actually calculate the lower bound on this cross section. So we replace epsilon mu mu by f prime over two t mu. Then we end up with a function which only depends on mv prime. So we can then plot this out and compare and compare with the experimental constraint. So the blue line is the lower bound on the cross section. So, so the predicted cross section is larger than this. So the only allowed, there are only allowed parameters space when and the prime larger than 1200 GDP. Why is there no blue blue production? Blue one, blue one. We try and boson I couples to top and bottom, top and bottom, couple to glue ones. Yeah, but which is you're saying it's bigger? I guess I'm just asking which is bigger. Yeah, right. So it's the from the right. I think he's talking about the decay. You're right, you're John. You're asking yeah, about the decay of the production. 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 The maximum rule on the the mini bike. Yeah, that's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have to come around on something? What did I do? Yeah, through Nanayam, the loop that works in the It's not once. Oh, after you let the symmetry break. Yeah. No, but it, 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 I think that's right. It's non resident. I mean, it's not zero, but there's no resident production. Right, because of what they are Yeah, yeah. 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 So, so now we get a, the lower bound on ND prime. And because we, we are interested in F prime, the scale, and ND prime. So we can use the same trick to make a plot on the viable parameter space over F prime versus ND prime. So each straight line in this previous plot will correspond to certain sigma mu mu. So comparing with 
that is the manual constraint, we can then determine the minimum F prime for different and different. So notice that the strong blue line here is just correspond to the strong blue line here. So, so the minimum and the prime is corresponding to this parameter too. And then we can transfer it to this F prime versus and the prime. So, so we can see there are still a lot of parameters space viable. And so after the LHC runs for another 20 years, what's the reach? It will still be, be around here. I remember it's around 2 TV and 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 you will you will see the similar wave here so it will so it will lower still, like here so it'll still be a large parameter space it's not ruled out yeah yeah so we'll never we can always keep writing papers about this for the rest of your life <laughs> especially for that discovery <laughs> But later I will mention like after we combine with composite his model, we will have some preferred value on F prime. If we don't want some large point tuning, then I think like the interesting parameter space will be ruled out. Okay. So actually so far this analysis is just based on the Z prime group who couples to standard model, third generation, universal. And I haven't put any information about composite his model, and I'm going to do this, do this. Okay, so now we want to put back the information about composite his model. So first thing we have is, so in the previous, section we only talked about this part. Now we include the hyperfermion. Then we can couple uh, we can calculate the running of gauge coupling. And this will put some upper bound on the on the strength of the coupling because we don't want it to reach long down for too fast. And the second one which is most important, which is the relation between the F prime and F. And the composite Higgs model, the, the composite Higgs model scale is constrained by the Higgs, Higgs physics. And it will put some new bound on, on the plot. So first, the constraint on the gauge coupling. So we can calculate the beta function, calculate how it runs, and when you will run to some non perturbative region. Then we separate into two cases because for different n hypercolor, we have different number of hyperfermions. So we need to separate. So we discussed two simple cases. One is n equal to two, the other is n equal to four. So they will give a different, different running. And if we want the lambda pole above Hong scale, then this the constraint for the GD prime at TED scale, which is actually quite strong. But if we relate the bound to 10 to 3 TeV, then the bound will be weaker. So later we will put both number on the plot. And then the constraint on the composite Higgs model scale. So we have a lower bound from the Higgs coupling measurement. So in this model, I just assume that simplest 
uh, deviation, which is both kappa to metal boson and for fermion are equal to cosine theta. And then the experimental constraint require the C smaller than 0.1, which require the scale F larger than 780 GeV. And I also put an upper bound here, which is kind of hand waving, it's my personal preference, which is above which I think the functioning is too long. And the estimation is kind of hand waving. I we can we already get we can calculate the quadratic term of the Higgs potential and assuming that it's loop induced, then the generic scale with that is like four pi times the, the number. So it's 800 GeV. And I just put this, multiply this by two and take this as my fine tuning back. It's very hand waving, but what I want to mention is that we actually want F as low as possible. It would be fast if it's just right above the current bound. Okay. Then we can combine with the previous plot on the F versus and zeta. So for so n equal to two case. F is almost equal to F prime by a factor of cosine theta. So in this case, we have our original plot and the coupling needs to be smaller than 2.4. So it will not reach London pole at 10 to the 3T this scale. And we can see the lower bound from his coupling is actually not that important because this two already ruled out the small f, f region. And the upper bound reduced a little bit from the original constraint, but there are still some parameters. Mm -hmm. So this green upper bound is from factoring? Yes. Okay. With 1.6 So, but the, the 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 other bound, the light green one, is the one from actually explaining the anomalies. Is that right? So I mean, you there mean, should be a bound. F can't be arbitrarily large, otherwise you wouldn't be able to explain the anomalies. Yeah, yeah. So this one is yeah. uh, that's the hard bound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the light green one is your fine tuning bound. Yeah. Okay, so this is for n equal to two case. And for n equal to four, then you can see the difference. So now the now this one, 1.2 1 become two, three, four. And your composite case model and, and now the constraint on the scale is above 1.6, and which is considered fine-tuning based on my preference. And, and the Higgs coupling constraint is no longer important, it's below here. And I think this tells us we will prefer the n equal to two cases, n equal to two case, which have some parameter space, which is not so fine tuning, like around one TeV or and will and will soon be explored. So any question on these two plots? So it's actually like what I mentioned in the the 
estimate of the scale. So if I equal to two, then it will give a Kerbin ratio, which is like the doom physics around one to two, one to two TeV. And for a larger n, then the ratio is smaller than the, the new physics from neutral current via normally is well above two T is above two TeV and it's probably not a good solution to a higher cost. What's the amount of What's the fine tuning? The fine tuning. Mm -hmm. Have 1% or 10% now? I think like 1.6 is around 10% fine tuning. So the math for the tensile math fall, then you won't have this problem. Yeah. <laughs> so you're saying that for n equal to 4, all the parameter space needs some 10% yeah. or even worse. So, the conclusion so, the different bosons from the SU4 over T4 from the mental composite Higgs model can explain the B anomaly. And I explore the property of this U1 prime, which is the third generation on number minus hyperbarium number and it will end up with the TV scale Z prime boson which couple universally to a third generation fermion. And the most important equation I think is the relation between the scale of Z prime and the scale of composite case model. And I find there is still interesting parameter space, which is viable and will be explored in the near future. And the future work I would like to do is like release some of the functions I made. Especially, I would like to explore the parameter space with a small set of E. And I'm still thinking it is possible. And from theory side, I think we should think about how to connect it with wave puzzle because I just assume it's third generation physics, but there could be, there might be some good reason for it and it might be related to the heaven of third generation for me. Okay. Any other questions? I, I, I do have questions, but I, I, I would like to go talk to Peter Graf, so I will find you later. I think it's a nice talk. Enjoyed it. Uh, I have some sort of more phenomenological questions, so I'll, I'll catch you later. Okay. So. Yeah, thank you again. Yeah.